Well, my name is Lev. I work in Spotify as a site reliability engineer. Well, I'm there since 2014. Keep Spotify running. So for those of us who don't know what is Spotify, Spotify is a music streaming service. We have a catalog with an albums and artists and tracks, and you can listen for music for free without ads or without ads for some small fee. Like, we are kind of big. We have more than 60 million monthly active users and more than 50 million paying subscribers, more than 30 million tracks, and so on. And we are growing. So now we are available on 58 markets. It's like almost half of the world. We are opening Spotify in new markets all the time. And we also own some capacity. So it's, it's not huge, not like Google, but pretty big. So we have four data centers, two in Europe and two in the United States. In Europe, it's in Stockholm and London, and in the United States, in Ashburn, on East Coast and on West Coast in San Jose. We also have more than 7,000 bare metal servers our infrastructure mostly running on the hardware servers. We use service-oriented architecture and have hundreds of different services. And also pushing a lot of traffic to the internet. I think that 35 gigabytes, gigabits is outdated, but anyway, it's a lot. And we work all the time. Music never stops playing. But yeah, let's talk about operations. So let's go back to the past and see what was in the beginning. So Spotify was founded in 2006 and went live in 2010, 8. And like, there was no DevOps, there was no microservices, there was no anything those time. So we started as most of the startup companies with one or less person doing all the operations, doing all the deployments and infrastructure and office IT and everything. But then over the time, number of operations engineers grew. So at some point, we came to the following scheme. So every service we own, and, like, and in, in 2008, it was not too many services, had its operations owner and development owner and the operations owner was responsible for helping developers and also for doing different operations tasks like deployment and doing monitoring of the service and backups and stuff. And besides that, all the operations engineers also were responsible for common operation stuff like being on call, set up monitoring systems, set up build system, and so on. And generally, every operations owner had, was responsible for more than one service at the time. So in 2011, all, we already were kind of big. So we had already 10 million users. And all operations responsibility was spread through a thin group of five people. So I think you can guess how many operations we have now. So now we have no team at all anymore. So I don't think that any of persons in this auditory thing looks like this guy now, because we all know no operations and stuff. But uh, before I continue on how we reorganize our operation services, uh, let's talk about Spotify engineering culture in general. So I think that for those of you who already heard about how Spotify uh, works inside, it's not news, but uh, so we are growing fast. And to handle and scale appropriate, we are following some basic principles. Like first, we have, a, as I already mentioned, service-oriented architecture. And Service-oriented architecture means that we have services where each service talks to one or multiple services through well-defined interfaces, and all the services are maintained and deployed separately. So we have 
a bunch of services that have some communication channels and stuff. So then we are following the Unix way and believe that code should be simple, short, modular, and extensible, and it should be easily maintainable and repurposed for by any developers, not only by its maintainer. So and also we are following keep it simple principle. So simplicity should be always a key goal in architectural design and we believe that unnecessary complexity should be always avoided. So yeah, as we already seen, this service oriented architecture and microservices and simple stuff bring us to a complex system in general. So Spotify have a hundreds of services now running there inside. So this picture doesn't represent how really Spotify works now, but it shows the main idea. So in general, system is pretty complex and consists of many moving parts, and there it's running on top of our infrastructure. So, but as a software developer or maintainer of some of the services, you don't need to understand how all system works in general. So you, you need to know only your component and components which you talk to. And most of the services are autonomous. So you can support your service or a bunch of services without knowledge of health of the whole system in general. And like we have a bunch of services, as I already said, and the number of the services is growing continuously. So all the time we are inventing new features and building new services. But yeah, let's see who maintains all this stuff. So to scale appropriate, not only software, but also organization, our developers are grouped into small teams called squads. So squad is a basic unit of development at Spotify. Every squad has a product-driven mission, and it's similar to a Scrum team, designed to feel like a mini startup. So people in squad sit together. They, don't, they have all the skills and tools that they need to design, develop, test, and release to production. And squads are self-organizing, and they can decide their own way of working. So some of them use Scrum sprints, some of them use Kanban, some of them use mix of these principles, some of them invent their own approaches. And every squad owns some services and features that they develop, support, maintain, and stuff. So in this picture, you can see that like in Spotify client, uh, different group of the interface are owned by the different squads. And every of the, each of this group is like self-isolated product. And like squad can own, for example, playlists from bottom from the backend part to the client. And they can like develop this feature and then integrate it into the platform that we provide. <coughs> so we have a lot of squads in Spotify now. And dealing with the multiple teams is always a challenge. And besides that, we have a different offices and they are located in different time zones. So matrix organizations that we have uh, help us to handle that. So all the scribes, all, all the squads in Spotify are grouped into, into tribes. Tribe is a collection of squads that works in related areas, such as like general backend services, desktop clients, mobile clients, or something like that. Or some feature squads that work in on similar features. So besides that, there is another unit, is chapter, which are like a small family of people that have a similar skills. And they are working in the same general area within the same tribe. Chapter leads who are leading the chapters are taking care of employees' career growth and they are trying to make sure that every employee has satisfied, is satisfied by his position. So every individual contributor in Spotify, I belong to two units, squad and chapter. That's why it looks like a matrix. So besides that, on every chapter, on, uh, there is a product owner who is a 
like an in startup entrepreneur. So he prioritizes work and takes into consideration both business value and technical aspects to set up a direction for squad to work. Besides that, we have uh, guilds that are more informal organization and they basically are a community of interest. So informal group of people who want to share their knowledge, tools, code, practices, and for example, Quality Assurance Guild, or Python Guild, or Linux User Guild. So we built our organization to be able to scale not only product, but also people. So if we come back to the previous slide, uh, can we scale this scheme? So how many engineers do you need to handle 100 services? Or even if you have 200, 500, 1,000 services? And how many should every engineer know about these services? And how easy is it to hire engineers nowadays? So I don't think that the, we can scale this scheme. And even if we can scale, it wouldn't be effective. So let me introduce you Ops and Squads, the initiative that we are following last couple of years. So what is Ops and Squads? Why we came to that? So at first, it's almost impossible to scale a central operations team. It's difficult to hire new engineers and difficult to find engineers who know all the operations stack from uh, hardware to um, application layer. And if you want to have uh, every engineer to be responsible for some service, he should understand the whole stack. So besides that, we believe that operations should sit close to development and collaborate with development to make better products and do it faster and more effective. And besides that, we want our squads to be autonomous. We don't want them to have any dependencies, and we want them to have end-to-end -end responsibility for services they build, because no one know services better than people who build that, build its services. So on this slide, you can see a timeline of evolution of our operations department. So uh, blocks, size of blocks on this slide doesn't really represent the amount of people working there. Like DF1 is pretty small. <laughs> but uh, you can see that in September 2013, we merged our site reliability engineers organization who was an operations department and began infrastructure development to one unit called infrastructure operations tribe. And at almost the same time we started an Ops and Squads initiative. So what is an infrastructure operations? So infrastructure operations is a tribe that consists of squads uh, and every squad has a product driven mission and your tribe provides a platform, tools, and support, documentation, and best practices for future squads who build the product itself. So future squads are responsible for their services now and do all the operations themselves. So now, instead of sysadmins, we have developers. And developers that ship platform tools and another product product related things to the future squads and operations responsibility is spread across the whole technical organization at the same time future squads are more autonomous and has no handovers to operations team anymore so you don't need to block on releases deployments you don't need to block on backups and stuff so but at the same time, future squads need to perform more operations now. And we expect a lot from Ops and Squads. So we expect the future teams doing themselves things like capacity planning and doing on call for services they own and do deployments and a lot of different things for every operations tasks. Uh, we want squads to use tool sets that provide that poor by infrastructure operations. And also, we are trying to write a good documentation, best practices, and provide a support to our future teams. So if you want to build a new service, you don't need to uh, 
do a research on how to maintain a hardware and how to maintain operation system, you can just go to our internal portal of infrastructure operations and find all the tutorials and best practices that we recommend to use. And you also can get tools to do deployments and to spawn your service to set up monitoring in a couple of clicks and web interface. Like how it works, for example, a uh, month ago we launched um, Spotify on Sony PlayStation. And at some point we found that our expectation in user growth is a bit less than than it, it was in fact. So we got a lot of new users. And one of the feature squads found that their product possibly will have a bottleneck at some point. And they were able, with a couple of clicks in web interface, to provide additional 200 new hardware servers. And then Puppet, our installation of automation, our service discovery systems, did their work, and in half an hour, they had additional new 100 barometers machine, barometer machines in cluster for their component. So, but sometimes something really bad happens, like fire in data center, or like angry sharks cut a fiber cable in the middle of the ocean. That, that, that really happened last year. And besides, despite being part of product-driven organization, site reliability engineers in r sometimes fall back into a support function in many situations that require immediate attention. So to handle that, we, build a, we found this pattern and build a core SRE organization, which consists of uh, highly skilled site reliability engineers across the IO tribe that beside being a part of uh, product-driven squads, also spend some time on doing some immediate, immediate stuff like resolving scalability issues, resol helping and coordinating with major incidents, explaining our platform, teaching best practices in general, and. doing another immediate action that we need. So during the time, like when Opsin Squads was just introduced, these guys spent most of their time on doing this baseline work. But nowadays in time, our future teams are learning, our infrastructure getting better, we had a better documentation, we had a more, f more operation tools that you are getting for free by just using our platform. So the amount of baseline work uh, that executed by the core SRE team by the time became smaller and smaller. So now we almost can sleep during the night and be, have a normal life as the usual people. So I also want to say a couple of words about incident manager procedures we have. So in Spotify culture, mistakes are fine and unless the same ones repeated twice. So for every incident, we, it should show every incident should be reviewed and appropriate remediation should be made to avoid the same incident in future. And anyone who may concern can attend the post-mortem and remediation meetings to influence its outputs. So if we have some mistakes that goes to incident, then we add more automation to avoid that. But services have different SLAs and reliability features. So immediate action not, not always required in different cases. And the incidents that doesn't affect the major functionality like music playback uh, doesn't uh, sh should be handled by uh, future squads themselves without attention of core SREs. So this approach helps us to be highly available. A uh, couple of thoughts about postmortems. So sorry for this wall of text, but it's, all these points is very important. So 
at first after every incident uh, we should we, we should schedule a postmortem and it, it's better to have it close in time because you have a uh, better memories and you can make review better so you always need to fix all the project details when you do it in postmortem to uh, to do better analysis and you should involve everyone who are in touch with the company that fails and the projects that fails and write all the result in in the tickets or in paper and plan appropriate remediations to set up automation or procedures in place that uh, will allow you to avoid and in this kind of incidents in future also postmortem should be shouldn't be a blame session so as we all know the blame blame policy doesn't work usually it doesn't bring us to any results so you shouldn't blame anyone we need to understand that this failure is a problem as a whole organization and like all the people in the teams and we need to resolve it together so after we write a postmortem we schedule remediations we execute these remediations and hopefully we have we wouldn't have same issues anymore in the future we also implemented uh, on-call schedules that follow the sun because we have an office in new york so we don't have people on call during the night anymore so every day we are shifting the duty on call duty at 1 p.m. Uh, on the New York time and on 19 at the Stockholm time and back at 7 I am on um, Stockholm time and 1 a.m. at New York time so now we we are receiving the calls on major incidents only during the day, during the work day, and we can take a rest and sleep at night. Yeah, but we also have a lot of areas to improve still. So first, sometimes expectations that we place on squads are unclear, and it's too many things to do. And we are trying to build a well-defined requirements and audit process for ops and squads. Besides that, questions that squads have not always fully understood by the team's provided infrastructure, including that includes documentation and best practices. We, we are continuously improving our quality of our support and quality of our documentation. And we see that during the time, the amount of questions get lower and quality of the products get better. Besides that, it's really hard to measure how successful is ops and squads because it's, we have uh, a lot of products and a lot of services and so we have a lot of services and it's hard to find a metric that we can define for, uh, for understand how, how good is ops and squads now. So we are trying to find some maybe SLAs or pager duty stuff and merge it and to make some key metrics to present it to management to show that this initiative works fine or to, and to understand ourselves that this initiative works fine or, and, or we need to do some actions to improve the quality of ops and squads. Besides that, we have a lot of problems with abandoned services and, and other ownership issues. So because of our organization is alive, the squads are changing their missions, changing their names, they reorganize. And sometimes the services that they own left without a new owner. So and at some point, when we find it out, it's hard to maintain and support them. So we are trying to 
or improve our internal systems and make the transfer in procedure, ownership transfer in procedure clearly and easier. Yeah. Thank you for your attention. Oh, questions? I have a question because you mentioned that you moved ops into the uh, feature squads. So the question is, uh, how do you manage to optimize the resources when you divide uh, ops into uh, different squads so they can't communicate and manage resources efficiently? So, so how do you manage it? Uh, it? It's not really clear from my presentation, but we have no ops and squads as a persons. So we move the operations responsibility to future teams as a whole unit, as like to the developers. So we have no dedicated operations persons in the squads. Instead of that, we, we want the whole, whole squad to have it responsi these responsibilities. And uh, what about, uh, for example, collocation and uh, hardware uh, configuration? Do you own the complete uh, chain or do you just uh, uh, buy it and don't bother with the, uh, you know, managing the bare hardware? So um, we provide an abstraction on top of hardware level. So if you are building some service, you can allocate it into the internal in, inside the internal systems, and then by clicking on the button, get a hardware. The same with the monitoring. So, as a future owner, you can just add metrics you want to our monitoring system, run tools that infrastructure operations provide to you, and have metrics in place. And absolutely the same policy for on call. So we have a pager duty and internal alerting systems. And as a service owner, you can set up. A key metrics and alerts for your service, for service that you own. And you can decide yourself, do you want to wake up at night to fix your service, or you want to make your service more reliable and, and skip the night alerts? So it's all in your hands, and we're not forcing developers to, to do something in only one way, in only one straight direction. So yeah, you can decide yourself on how do you maintain your service. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, hi. Uh, do you observe the situation in the team that even if the whole team is responsible for the uh, infrastructure task, that there actually is only one or two people that are actually doing it always, so that the, even though the whole team should be responsible, uh, within the team they are always like picking one or two people who are always doing the stuff and not the whole team is doing it? Or do you not have this, this issue, this problem? Yeah, sometimes it happens, but you know, so we are trying to provide an autonomous, autonomous, autonomous uh, possibility to be autonomous for the sports. So if it's comfortable for you as a team to have a dedicated person in your team, you're welcome. But like you as a team should also should uh, pay attention to how effective you are and how, how fast you deliver in your product and how, how depends on, on this dedicated person and so on. So some teams maybe are, are good with that, sometimes not. So it's not really our problem, it's a, it's a decision of the teams that do software. Not really. So what we're trying to understand now is to how how many teams doesn't do the procedures that are required, that always required for any service, like doing 
uh, set up in two data centers to make their service reliable and independent for network, for example. So we are trying to find now we are trying to find the metrics that show us that this percent of teams doesn't fit the requirements that we have in company in general. So after that, we will try to improve. After, after fixing that, we will try to improve uh, experience inside the teams. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so I have a question. I know that Spotify has or used to have uh, one of the biggest Hadoop clusters in, in Europe. Right, so you physically have a data center and a couple hundred servers. Uh, how do you manage those? And does like this guild thing apply to, to the data center as well? So, uh, in our infrastructure operations tribe, we have a squad that is responsible for Hadoop and data analysis, and they maintain the, this cluster and they maintain the tools that uh, and other people in company can then use to get the reports from that. So I, I'm not a part of the Hadoop team itself, and don't know exactly what, in, in details, how they manage this. But in general, it looks like that. Okay, thanks. Okay, so if you don't have any question, <clears throat> thank you very much for yeah. coming. Now we have ten.